Welcome to The Motivational Midwife. My name's Lynn Jones, and today we are going to be looking at NIPE Part 2, which is the actual conditions we screen for. So, newborn infant physical or NIPE part two. Let's have a quick recap on what it is. So it's part of a national screening program. It's done at two points in time. The first within 72 hours of birth, which in a lot of cases happens within the hospital setting before um, the baby goes home or within a clinic within a hospital setting. And then it's repeated again uh, at six to eight weeks, very often at the GPs or health visitor clinics. It's looking for issues with four key areas. So issues with the heart, hips, eyes, and if it's a male infant, testes. And all the information in all three of the um, NIPE videos that we're doing is uh, taking information from the NIPE screening program handbook, which is available online. And I have put a link in the box below to it. So the first thing we'll look at is the eyes and, and specifically we're looking for congenital cataracts, so about two, 200 babies a year born with that. And a cataract really is um, an opacity behind the lens. Um, and if you should pick one up, to be fair, um, you're likely that if you've got one in one eye, there's a 50% chance actually that both eyes will be uh, affected. So when we're looking at risk factors, um, we're thinking um, of things like family history and particularly first degree relatives. Um, and even if you find no issue on the NIPE itself, if there's a first degree relative that has um, a significant problem. So we're thinking of things like uh, aniridia, so no iris there, uh, coloboma, where there's a malformation. Um, or retoblastinoma, so that's a, a malignant tumour of, of the retina, any of those sort of things. Um, if there's a particularly a first degree relative with that, it may be worth um, seeking specialist um, opinion anyway, even if you don't pick anything up on the, the NIPE itself. So any of those sort of genetic syndromes uh, as well that put babies more at risk of eye problems, so things like trisomy 21, um, if the mother's been exposed to um, some viruses, so things like cytomegalovirus, rubella, um, they can also um, predispose this baby to serious eye problems. Um, sensorineural hearing loss, so this is where there's actually um, an abnorm abnormal function of the um, nerve in the inner ear. Um, and if the baby's sort of neurodevelopment issues as well. Um, if there is a, a family history of um, eye problems that actually develop, not necessarily at birth, but quite in early childhood or infancy, it really um, is important important to just uh, make sure that the parents know how they can access a quick referral um, should things start to um, develop on their own baby. And again, as I said, if, you, if you've got any concerns, even if you don't find anything on NIP, it's often worth seeking that opinion from a, a specialist. Um, so before the examination, it's important that we discuss the screening test, gain consent from the parents, um, informed consent to go ahead with the examination. Um, and ideally, towards the end of pregnancy, it's a good idea to refer parents back to that you and your baby screening test booklet that they would have been given antenatally, because that has not only all the tests that are offered to them 
as the pregnant woman, but at the back, Elsa has all the tests that are offered to the baby, including the nipe. Have a good look at the uh, mother's obstetric history and mode of delivery. Uh, were there any issues at birth, um, gestation of the baby? Was the mother exposed to any um, infections during pregnancy? Have a look at her family history. Um, check the scans. Was there any issues flagged up on scans? Very unlikely from an eye point of view, but other things can be picked up and you know really you're just establishing are there any risks for eye disorders with this particular baby and before you do anything else you need to make sure you've got your ophthalmoscope ready um, and you're assessing the eyelids to make sure that they they look normal for the ethnicity of the baby remember your um, so maybe uh, Chinese babies um, often have uh, their uh, epithelial folds are often more um, pronounced so um, that would be normal for that baby's ethnicity but maybe not for a different baby so assess the eyelids uh, make sure that there are no abnormalities that there's no birthmarks port wine staining uh, any sort of birthmarks around the the eyes or close to the eyes um, or eyelids uh, really do warrant uh, an opinion because they can cause um, issues for the baby and they can also um, interfere with the baby's ability to open its eyelids. If a baby's had an instrumental delivery often the eyelids are quite swollen um, and certainly if this test is being um, screening is being done within the first 24 hours um, which very often certainly where I work it's, it's often done within that first 24 hours um, babies may not yet be opening both eyes um, fully so you need to make sure and this seems obvious really that there are two eyes there and it seems like a very obvious statement but to be fair unless you actually see two eyes you can't be 100 certain 100 certain that there are two eyes there so if the baby hasn't opened its eyes you do gently need to um, part the eyelids to make sure there is actually an eyeball in both sockets um, symmetry of the eyes uh, and clarity of the cornea um, so you know it, it, the diameter of that is similar to the diameter of your uh, little fingertip so ideally you want a nice settled baby um, if the baby is not very settled then sometimes what works quite well is to uh, get the parent to hold the baby over uh, upright over their shoulder and they very often will open their eyes then and you can undertake the examination then. You really want the room, um, the lights quite dim um, and uh, ideally shut the curtains, dim overhead lights and you're bringing the ophthalmoscope um, to the baby about an arm's length, your arm's length obviously not the baby's arm's length, uh, away from the baby's face and direct the light uh, from the outside towards the baby's eye and if you need to part the baby's eye then um, that's perfectly acceptable to do but ideally if the baby can open its eyes spontaneously it's, it's better for you. And what you're looking for is red reflex, you're also looking to see does the baby's um, eyes react to the light, uh, <coughs> excuse me, so look through the ophthalmoscope and very much like when you take a picture with a flash, um, you will get a little red eye. That's essentially what you're looking for. You're looking to see is there any shadows on um, in the eye on, on that um, lens? Can you see anything there? Um, and what you're looking for really is, is a, a nice uh, red slash pinky um, circle looking back at you. Um, if there are, if it's misshapen, if it's very pale, if it's absent, that could indicate a problem. Now, babies with darker skins often do have paler um, red reflexes, so it may not be abnormal. But if you're not sure, it's always best to get a second opinion from a senior um, neonatologist. I've, <coughs> excuse me, I've had um, only one baby in my career that I couldn't find a reflex on at all, I had nothing, absolutely nothing um, when I was looking, no no pale reflex, no just nothing at all and that was on a, a 
Asian baby and that baby had an urgent ophthalmology re referral um, within about two hours of my examination. It went straight across to um, the ophthalmic department. Um, I didn't actually find out, unfortunately, what the outcome was for that baby. And then when I was a community midwife, uh, long before I'd undertaken my NIP training, I at I went to see one of my ladies that I hadn't seen as I'd been on annual leave. It was her 10th day, so it was a discharge visit. And the parents had just mentioned that they could see a little white dot in her eye. And it wasn't obvious initially, but when I took the baby over to the window and the light shone on, I could see this tiny little white dot in the baby's eye. And this is where it's very important to actually take parents' concerns uh, very seriously um, and get them a review of their baby if they're not happy with something. Now, I wasn't sure what it was at all, um, so sent it in to have a neonatal review by the paediatricians, and it turned out to be a small cataract. Um, and I'm not, I'm not sure why it wasn't picked up on, on NIPE, but it obviously wasn't the it was very very small um, and when we're thinking about the you know the six week uh, examination again take those parents it's not likely to be you as a midwife but uh, parents concerns need to be taken on board so if the eyes are very wobbly if the babies are not able to open their eyes fully by that if there's sort of any sort of um, asymmetry with the eyes um, if the red reflex is not the same in both eyes, um, or if there is, as I say, nothing there or a little bit of white there, it really needs to be um, reviewed. So if you don't find anything on your um, Nike examination, that's fine. You just tell the parents that that, that will be checked again at six to eight weeks um, in the primary care setting. But if you do find something, as I say, generally um, the pathway will say they have to see an ophthalmologi ophthalmologist within two weeks of the screening. But if it's significant, such as uh, the baby I found with no reflex, uh, red reflex at all, um, then an urgent um, referral before the baby goes home is, is probably the best way to go because then that baby um, gets seen and treated promptly. Um, if it's a severe cataract, it's usually done, um, the surgery to remove that cat cataract is done uh, quite early. So, you know, six to 10 weeks is quite young, but it does, that does show that it gets the best uh, visual outcomes. So they're less likely to have long term um, problems. <laughs> and if the, um, if they're seen in the, um, at the six to eight weeks and there's a, uh, uh, an issue flagged up, then they, they need to see a um, consultant or paediatric uh, ophthalmology service by the time they're 11 weeks old. Right, so moving on to the cardiovascular system and really our purpose of looking at this is to pick up any congenital heart disease. Um, and that really is a problem with the structure and or function that's present from birth and that will uh, range from non-significant uh, so sort of minor murmurs to major and critical ones so there's about eight babies per thousand okay so depending you know the 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 more frequent tend to be the non-significance and the the serious ones are obviously less. So critical uh, congenital heart disease accounts for 15 to 25 percent. So that's a quarter of all of the um, problems that are picked up are actually critical ones. And we do get lulled into a bit of a false sense of security when we're doing the cardiovascular examination in that, oh, they've had a scan and um, there wasn't any problems picked up on their anomaly scan. But actually scans only pick up about 50% of cardiac problems. So when you're undertaking the NIPE examination, there is a huge responsibility uh, on you to actually um, do it well. 
So risk factors, obviously, um, we've got a family history. So any uh, first degree relative, particularly of uh, congenital heart disease from birth. If there is any um, trisome, any of the trisomies, they do tend to have, particularly trisomy 21, do tend to have a higher risk of cardiac defects. And certainly uh, when I was a student, my 10th delivery was an undiagnosed uh, Down syndrome baby. Uh, and initially they thought um, that there wasn't anything other than the, the, the Downs, but within a week or so, he had also developed uh, quite significant cardiac uh, issues as well. If the scan has picked up a cardiac uh, abnormality, and remember I said only 50% are picked up from the antenatal scan, uh, scan. and again, similar to the eyes, if mater the maternal um, the mother's been exposed to viruses uh, such as rubella, particularly rubella during early pregnancy, um, if they have got underlying medical conditions, things like diabetes, um, epilepsy, uh, lupus, those sort of things can uh, also predispose, particularly with diabetes, particularly um, uncontrolled diabetics. Um, again, certainly um, the ones I've come across uh, with significant cardiac uh, issues have been quite poorly controlled diabetic women. And tetragenic drugs uh, that have been taken during pregnancy, so drugs that have are known to, to cause an issue, but uh, may have been taken before she realised she was pregnant. So before the examination, as with any aspect of the NIPE, take that detailed uh, medical and obstetric history, including any medication she's on, because we've said some of those medications could be tetragenic. Um, looking at the baby's family history, history, how has the baby been immediately post-birth as well, in that immediate postnatal period? Have there been any issues? Have there, um, you know, has the baby shown any signs of um, respiratory distress? Um, so, you know, is, has the colour remained appropriate for its ethnicity? Does the, the colour change when the baby is feeding or at rest? Uh, does the baby become very tachypneic? Um, do, is the baby very lethargic? Um, uh, is the muscle tone good? All of these things could indicate um, a cardiac issue. So when you're first looking at the baby, you're looking at its general tone, um, its uh, behavior, its position. Um, um, Central and peripheral colour, remember hands and feet are often quite uh, pale or blue, particularly in the first 24 hours after birth as that peripheral circulation gets going. Um, if you um, place a, a finger on, on the sternum and do a little bit of pressure, what's the uh, capillary refill like? Size and shape of the chest, you know, does it look normal for that baby? Um, can you can you see um, any obvious? So sometimes with some babies, you can actually see uh, the heart sort of beating through the chest. Um, respiratory rate, as we've said, is it tachypneic? Um, have we got any signs of uh, respiratory distress? So is it grunting? Is it got nasal flaring? Um, does it really seem to be struggling with its breathing? Um, things that you're palpating for as well, you are palpating for um, heaves and thrills, which could indicate a murmur. You're um, palpating both the femoral and the brachial pulses for strength, rhythm and volume. So your femoral pulse, um, uh, your right brachial and your left femoral should be equal in strength, rhythm and volume. Um, so we've said about capillary refill. Um, where is your cardiac apex? Normally, as say, if you would put your hand across um, the baby's chest to get the point of maximum impulse, and that's usually the apex, which is in most instances is about a centimetre below the left nipple. Um, 
palpating the the liver um so it's not uncommon to feel a little bit of, of liver but ideally you don't want to feel anything but if there's an if you can feel an excessive <coughs> excuse me amount of liver it may be linked to congestive uh, heart failure and to say if we if you have your hand on the baby's um chest are you feeling any uh heave so is it really the chest really sort of rising up to to meet your hand uh, a little bit like me today breathing um or can you feel like a, a cat purr under your under your hand which is is um known as a thrill and they could be linked with uh, cardiac abnormalities so um we're looking ideally you are using a, a pediatric stethoscope i don't think i actually have one here I think I have. so this is your normal stethoscope that you would use but this is your um pediatric one it has a smaller end and it's not the tiny little near neonatal one but a pediatric one is gold standard for undertaking your examination so you will get that nice clear sounds when you're listening and you're listening <clears throat> so you've got mid clavicular second intercostal space um sternum left so this this side is your pulmonary area um on the right side is your aortic and then fourth intercostal space on the left side is your tricuspid. And then fifth is your apex or your mitral valve. And then if you turn the baby over and listen mid scapula, you've got the area where you may have a coarctation if there's a, an issue there. We'll go into all of those a little bit more depth when we um, do the next video, which is the actual examination. So some of the signs and symptoms. So if the baby is tachypneic, particularly when it's resting, all babies do a little bit of quick breathing and stopping. That's normal. But if it seems to be breathing fast all the time, that's not necessarily normal. Um, so obviously, if it stops breathing for um, periods of more than 20 seconds or that's associated with a change in colour, that could, you know, needs a, a certainly needs a view. Um, if we've got any signs of respiratory distress, so either uh, intercostal, subcostal, sternal or uh, suprasternal recession, so that, that the little muscles between the ribs are sucking in, the baby's really trying, you know, it's obvious that the baby's struggling to breathe, uh, you've got nasal flaring, so those nostrils are really flaring out as that baby is trying desperately to get some extra oxygen in. If the baby is uh, cyanotic centrally, so centrally blue or pale, so say if you can see visible um, pulsations, heaves, thrills over the precordium, so this sort of area. If you're struggling to feel the, um, the femoral pulses, um, sometimes that is just a positional thing and it, it, it does take practice to really um, get good at feeling femoral pulses and often some of the one of the things that people do is they actually apply too much pressure so they've occluded the pulse so you, you don't feel it because you've actually blocked it off so um you just need enough a light touch but enough pressure that you can actually feel that pulse and if you hear uh cardiac murmurs or extra heart sounds and we, again we'll go into those in a little bit more depth when we um do the next video so just looking a little bit about murmurs, significant murmurs uh, tend to be very loud. They're, they're heard over a, a wide area. They have a kind of harsh quality to them, and they're often associated with other abnormal findings as well. Um, and your uh, benign murmurs, your physiological murmurs. So think about what's happening um, physiologically when that baby is making that adaptation from interuterine to extrauterine life so when the baby's inside um, blood doesn't particularly need to go to very much of it to the lungs because the lungs are not in use the baby's not breathing um, using the lungs in utero the placenta's doing all the work so you have the foramen ovale which is the flap between the two atria so the blood bypasses the lungs <clears throat> Once the baby's born, those pressures change, that flap tries to shut, so the blood is forced to go to the lungs. 
Now, it can take, you know, a good sort of 24, 40 hours for that flap to completely shut. Um, so particularly if you do your nipe quite early within the, that 24 hours, you are more likely to pick up that sort of benign physiological uh, heart murmur. And they tend to be sort of short, soft, soft, systolic. They tend to be located really on that sort of left sternal border. Um, having said that, they might be absent in a baby that has got a um, significant defect. So if you pick up um, no problems at all, if there's everything seems fine, then the baby will just be reviewed again at six to eight weeks. Um, but if you have any concerns at all, um, particularly in the early neonatal period, then it, the baby does need to be reviewed. And the um, urgency with which the baby will get seen uh, will depend very much on the clinical condition of the baby. <clears throat> now, when I was a community midwife, and again, long before I'd done uh, my NIPE training, uh, I saw two babies about two or three weeks apart, not my ladies, both day 10, just going out to uh, do a discharge visit on them. And the only symptom both these babies had was that they seemed to be quite tachypneic. They seemed to be breathing quite fast for a 10 day old baby. Um, and I was thinking maybe they have got a bit of a chest infection. And uh, so I sent them in for a review, sent them to hospital for a review by a paediatrician. Um, and they both turned out to have cardiac issues. One of them quite serious. It was blue lighted down to Great Ormond Street and in surgery fairly quickly. Uh, and that really did um, unnerve me because I thought, gosh, if I hadn't have sent that baby in, would that baby have then become a cot death baby? Possibly, who knows? Um, so it is important, it is crucial, I, I feel, that you know we do make parents aware of those key signs and symptoms to look out for um, to get their baby reviewed again. So looking at developmental dysplasia of the hips, we're really looking to pick these up early so we can minimise um, the long term complications because we'll get timely ultrasound scans to confirm the diagnosis and expert uh, assessment in and treatment if it's required nice and early. So about three to five per thousand babies um, require actually uh, intervention in the way of a, a harness, uh, particularly a pavlic harness. Um, and of those babies, maybe only one or two require actual surgery. But if we miss picking up those um, unstable hips and therefore treatments delayed, in the long term, we end up with lots of complex surgery um, or uh, long term implications is that they have long term mobility problems, pain, osteoarthritis um, in their hip and their back. So early intervention is crucial. So if you've got a first degree family relative, um, particularly or the baby has, particularly siblings, um, that have had a hip problem that, that was either present at birth or when they were a toddler, young child that did require more than just sort of observation or a, a double nappy. If they were treated with splints or harnesses or operations, then they, they, that is a significant risk factor. And all these babies would automatically be referred for a hip scan or should be automatically referred for a hip scan which is normally done within um, six weeks, I believe. If the baby is a uh, breech birth or has been breech uh, around 36 weeks or later, irrespective of which way it actually, so even if it was um, a breech and she had successful ECV or it rotated on its own to a phallic, um, that baby will still need um, a hip scan. Um, if it's a breach presentation at time of birth um, from 28 weeks onwards, uh, again, hip scan required. And if you have a multiple uh, birth, so twins or triplets, and one of them or more of them have been breached, then all of those babies will require scanning. So as with all the other um, things we're screening for, review the mother's uh, medical and obstetric history, family history, is there any uh, NIPE hip risk factors? And have the baby on a nice uh, 
warm environment on a firm, flat surface with the baby undressed and settled because a relaxed baby is much easier to do a hip examination on than one that is crying and screaming. Um, before you do anything, you're looking at the symmetry of the, uh, the, the legs, the leg length. Um, if you flex the knees um, up, do the tops of the knees meet. So if I have my baby uh, lying flat and I put its feet flat on the floor, do the tops of my knees, are they uh, equal or have I got one higher than the other or lower? Um, is there any restriction when you're abducting the hips? Um, both the Barlow and the Ortolani test uh, should be done on each hip separately. You will see some paediatricians doing them both together, but that is poor practice. They should be done one at a time so that you're assessing each individual's hip st stability. Your Barlow manoeuvre, so your Barlow manoeuvre is the, the push down one. And again, when we do the actual examination uh, in the next video, I'll go into those in a bit more detail, but the, that's the pushy down one. And that's looking to see if a hip is dislocatable. So can it be pushed out of the joint? And the Ortolani, which is the swingy round one, uh, that is um, used to, uh, if a hip is already dislocated, it will clunk back into place. Um, we used to, years ago, use uh, skin crease symmetry. Um, so what are the creases on the, the back of the, the legs equal, round near the buttocks and that, but that's not really part of um, the nipe now, so we don't use skin crease uh, symmetry. So again, if there's no issues um, on your um, examination, unless uh, the baby has got risk factors, in which case you will refer it for a hip scan appointment anyway. Uh, that baby will be seen again at six to eight weeks. Um, screen positive is um, deemed if you feel uh, an abnormal clinical hip exam, so with or without risk factors. OK, so if you if you get a clunk or you can feel that that hip a bit dislocating, um, or you have any of these key things, difference in leg length, um, all of those things, uh, then that would be deemed screen positive and you'd follow the, the NIPE pathway for that. So um, you're aiming to get your um, scan results uh, within the target time scale for um, babies who are very preterm. So between you know less than 34 weeks, um, you're aiming for that to be done between 30 eight weeks and 40 weeks of their corrected age. Um, and uh, more than 34 weeks, we the, there should be an outcome decision by the time the baby is six weeks old. Certainly um, at the trust that I work at your, our time scale is to get that baby scanned within two weeks. And um, we have a one-stop clinic, so it has the scan and then sees the, the pediatrician as well. And I think I've just gone through all these bits, haven't I? Um, Yes, I have. <laughs> so moving on to testes for our male babies. So again, the purpose is to uh, identify either bilateral, so both um, testes that have not descended into the scrotum or one of them haven't descended into the um, scrotum. So again, two to six percent of male babies born at term and one in a hundred of these will have testes that stay undescended unless they're treated. So, you know, more than you'd think. <clears throat> if you've got both undescended testes, then it could be uh, an indicator of ambiguous genitalia or some sort of endocrine disorder. So that would warrant really um, a referral quite quickly. I would get a senior um, paediatrician to come and review that baby fairly quickly. Um, and you need to exclude um, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Um, with ones that you can't, if you can't palpate both of them. So looking at risk factors, any uh, first degree relative, again, uh, low birth weight babies, preterm babies, um, small for gestational age babies. Again, as with the others, obtain a full history, look at the size, uh, symmetry, color of the, the test of the scrotum. 
and palpate the scrotal sac um you're looking um to find both of them do do it together because otherwise there is um the potential that you're feeling the same testy it's just pinged across to your other things so you really need to try and feel both of them simultaneously if you can't feel one, then you may need to, again, we'll go through this in a little bit more detail, but you can go to the inguinal canal and try and uh, milk, what we call milk, the um, testy down into the scrotum. If there's only, <clears throat> if you can feel both of them, but they're high, um, then manage it as you would a screen positive finding. And I would get a senior review for that. Excuse me. Again, babies uh, screen negative, they'll be reviewed again at six weeks. Uh, babies that are screen positive for uh, uh, both of them that you can't uh, feel, that would be uh, certainly an urgent referral um, by a senior paediatrician. And uh, if there's a unilateral one, so you can't feel one, um, then just reassure the parents that that will be reviewed again by the GP at six to eight weeks of age uh, and if uh, it's persistent um, the GP would continue to see that baby again at maybe four months four to five months at which point it would uh, be referred for possible surgery so key points to think about when you're doing your NIPE is we must gain informed consent that we take a full history both family and obstetric that we have a nice warm environment to undertake the examination in which is um, um, uh, with a bit of privacy which is a challenge in hospital settings definitely that we have a firm flat surface to undertake the hip examination on if you pick up anything that you are doubtful of then obviously get it reviewed a senior review and then document all your findings um, in the uh, NIPE smart system your trust notes your baby records uh, be they electronic or handheld and make sure you share all that information with the parents and there you have it nipe part two i hope you found that useful if you haven't subscribed to the channel please do please share with your friends anyone you think that might find it useful and uh, the next one we do we'll be looking at the actual examination in some detail and i look forward to seeing you next time